Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 30th of the eighth month, which also happens to be the 12th of November, uh, 2022, on the Gregorian calendar. And today, we, we've already had some pretty decent discussions, but we would like to go over on our Shabbat study where the name Jesus comes from. And by the providence of our Father through our Creator and His Mishnah, Yahuwah Yahushua, we've been able to have information where we can track that name all the way through history. Now, I'm not going to say this to offend anybody or to be mean, but I would like to share with you what we've found to be written. Now, I have a few references in this, and then everyone's free to look up what the horse actually represents in scripture. You can just do a word search on the horse, go to the Strong's and find every, or like an online Strong's concordance, and you can look up every use of that word in the scriptures. And when you do that, you'll find some interesting things. But through the course of learning, I've discovered that the Germans were originally Hebrews that went apostate, more or less. And as they left, the language changed into what we know as Germanic. The same thing with the Celtic-speaking peoples. It was originally Hebrew, which you can find from this book before us, The Ancient History of Caledonia, as well as other references. Um, I've shared them in the comments for this post, and I'll, we'll look over it a little bit. But to get on point here, from the earliest reference of the worship of the horse, <clears throat> you have the sons of Yawin, or Yepheth, had Yawin, and Yawin had the Ketim. They were what became the Greek people, but they were also dwelling with sons of, uh, sons of Hebrews that left Egypt before the exodus of Moshe. This is known in antiquity. I believe it's also covered a little bit in scripture where you have Darda, Calcol, and others mentioned as the wise men from the east that were known amongst the Greeks that the chokma or wisdom of Shalomo surpassed. And those men, Calcol, which is Cadmus, uh, He-Man, Mahol, the sons of Zerah, were taking Hebrews and founding city-states. They founded Attica, the kingdom of Attica, Athens, Troy, and a few other places. After the fall of Troy, the Hebrews that stayed true to the laws of the altar eventually landed in Montrose, what we call the highlands of Scotland, and they were known as the Caledonians, or the Kuldi, the, the Chaldean, or what they call the Chaldeans, which is why uh, the main bad guys for Babylon are called Chaldeans Kazd instead of Chaldeem, because the Romans hated them. But the paganized Trojans, a great majority of them that weren't enslaved, went over to Italy, and you can find that in the records of the ancient, Brit the ancient kings of Britain, where it starts with after the fall of Troy, and then the founding of London by Brutus. <clears throat> but these are just references that point to the facts of Hebrews migrating there, turning pagan, and, and mixing in with the sons of Yepheth. The first reference to the, the worship of the horse from them, however, is at the founding and fall of Troy, which we're going to cover right here. So it says, here is the founding and fall of Troy. The first mention of worship of the horse or Hasus, and the end result of those doing so, which is being consumed in devil's fire, as we'll read in the text here. But this is from the ancient history of Caledonia, which is a historical record of the remnant of his people that kept the laws of the altar until the coming of our Mashiach. And then they got the good news and the Torah or the Ten Commandments, and they kept it those until their uh, dispersion as a people and the influence of Catholicism in their country, which happened around 1290 AD and the fall of their kingdom. When Edward Longshanks came up and seized power, then it was in 1320 where you had 
uh, Robert the Bruce after William Wallace, who was a Caledonian, foretold in this book. But you had Robert the Bruce as king and his nobles that were Catholics petitioning the Little Horn and mentioning that they were of the seed of, of Israel as well, which the Scots and the Caledonians were two different waves of, of Hebrews coming to that area. That's a story for a different time, however. But in their own declaration of independence or the declaration of Araboth, if you will, they mentioned that they were petitioning the Little Horn to allow them to keep their own sovereignty and kingdom, but they were all Catholic at the time. The true believers of the Chaldean belief were in dispersion, went down south, started movements there with the Reformations, and eventually a great many of them came to America with the Puritans to serve or to be able to keep the truth. But this is the beginning of their history. It says, after the death of Pharaoh, who loved Yahusuf, the king of Mitzrayim and his rulers saw that the Hebrews prospered more than the Egyptians. In the book of Yobelim, you can see that it was actually the, the sovereign of Canaan was fighting against Pharaoh, and he eventually won, took over, closed the borders for 40 years, which was during the time when Moshe's father was still in Canaan building the tombs for burying the dead. And he was separated for 40 years from his wife, Yochebed, which was the daughter of uh, Louis and his aunt. But that's a different thing for another time. Just to give you a reference for what was going on in, in the time frame we have here. It was a Canaanite who took over and was Pharaoh of Egypt that plotted to have the children oppressed because all the Canaanites were under the curse and not to be forgiven. They were, he was, they were being used by Satan as his minions to do his will. This is the, the king of Mitzrayim and his rulers saw that the Hebrews prospered more than the Egyptians, that their fields and their vines were more fruitful and pleasant, and also that their wives and daughters were more fair and beautiful than their own. Pharaoh, the king, then made a law that all those who did not bow down the knee to the bull and offer sacrifices upon the king's altar were to be double tithed or double taxed and their children brought into slavery, which grieved the Hebrews very much, but they still remembered their Elohim and went to the desert and offered sacrifice to the El of Bethel. Pharaoh then, being wroth at this, brought all the Hebrews under slavery. The Egyptian slaves got straw to make their bricks, but the Hebrews had to collect stubble and make the same number of bricks as the Egyptians, which made their task very grievous to bear. But they still trusted that Elohim would deliver them from bondage. Then King Pharaoh was enraged and ordered all the Hebrew children to be slain when they were born. This caused several of the tribes of the Hebrews to draw together, who never defiled themselves among the Egyptians or Mitzrayim. They then departed into the desert and withdrew themselves from among them. Pharaoh the king, being wroth, pursued them into the desert with horses and chariots. The Yisraeli seeing Pharaoh's host at hand, cried to the El of Bethel to deliver them from the hand of their enemy. Then the Elohim of Shemaim raised a storm of wind and sand, mountains high, so that they could not find them, and afterwards left them to wander through the desert of Assyria, chiefly living upon fruit. If you're familiar with antiquity in the history of the ancient Middle East, you had originally Assyria come to power before Babylon, and the pre-dominant nations, the Assyrians were the ones that were doing uh, evil and afflicting people and becoming a dominant power. Be uh, that was subdued during the reign of Dawid, or David, if you will, 
and they were no longer a chief power when the children were predominant in ruling pretty much the world over. They they had prominence during the reign of Shalomo. And it was after the time of Shalomo with the splitting of the kingdom that the Assyrians started rising to power again to overthrow the northern kingdom around the 700s BC. So it says, the king of Greece observing encampments and being at war with the Egyptians and Assyrians sent an ambassador to inquire if they had broken the truce that had been made. But they found nothing but working men of crafty work, namely copper, brass, dyeing and weaving, and also brick making. The king then, finding they were Hebrews, dispatched an Hebrew interpreter. So you can see that the king of Greece already had a Hebrew interpreter with him. The, uh, someone who spoke and was fluent with Hebrew because there it was not an uncommon event for them to be mixed there. It was actually Cadmus, the Hebrew, that brought the alphabet, the alphabet to the Greeks. And their original ancient Greek alphabet was synonymous with what we call Phoenician, which is Hebrew. And that was adopted by the Latins again, but changed. And that was where we get the alphabet of today. This is the king then finding that they were Hebrews dispatched an Hebrew interpreter whom they told that they were no rebellious people, that they were under the necessity of fleeing from Egypt to the desert from the oppression and cruelty of Pharaoh. The Hebrew servant returned and told the king of Greece that they were not men of war, but were working men or craftsmen of Egypt. The king, being pleased with such good news, sent his servant again, telling them, pitch their tents in any plain in his dominions where they pleased, telling them at the same time that they could worship their own El after their fashion, or their own fashion. The Hebrews then built an altar to Yahuwah and offered sacrifice for his great deliverance in delivering them from the hands of the Egyptians, or Mitzrayim. And this is what they call Mount Ida in Turkey. It was Mount Yahud or the mountain of Yahuda, where they would go make their offerings and once a year. The same thing could be found in Crete with the next place they went to. They put another altar on the high mountain. That's where they would go to celebrate their deliverance. But uh, these things aren't mentioned too much anymore. <clears throat> This is the king of Greece visited their camps with his Hebrew servant, telling them to build a city and fortify themselves against their enemies, whoever they might be. They having confidence in this king of Greece and seeing that Yahuwah's hand was in their deliverance, commenced to build the city of Troy. It was Dardanus or Darda that originally went over there and his son Toraz was the one who the city was named after. And they all became Torazians or Trojans, if you will. It says, the materials of which this city was built were bricks made of clay. This clay was dug to make a canal round the whole city with drawn bridges to draw up at any time for securing them from their enemies. The work went on rapidly that or the work went on so rapidly that they soon found themselves in a fortified position. And as the population increased, so did the city enlarge. The building going on with much vigor, and at the same time, the other tradesmen were employed at their own trades, supplying the other nations around them with purple, scarlet, and fine linen. And, inst and war instruments of brass, copper, and iron. This surprised the king of Mitzrayim, or Egypt, very much. He, having labored under the impression that all the Hebrews were consumed in the mountains of sand, which nearly destroyed the Egyptians. Now, if you don't know, I'll let you know. The land was originally named Mitzrayim, after Mitzrayim, the son of Ham, 
And he was also known in antiquity as Zoroaster or the living star, also a title and name given to Ham. That's why there's two Zoroasters that are known, one from Bractea and the other. They had different titles from different peoples. The Greeks called them Zoroaster or living star because of the, with the magic that they would, he would do. But back on point, Mitzrayim is the one who, the builder of the enclosure or the, the builder of the straits where they built the straits to afflict the people. But he was literally the one that built the Nile the way it was. So it wasn't flooding the entire land there. And it was a flowing stream up to the, uh, the tributaries of the Delta there in the north. This is made evident if you look at the etymology of his name and what's expounded on in the book called Two Babylons, which I can't remember the name of the author at the moment, so I'm sorry. If, I, if it comes to me, I'll let you know. This is, but these had rather served as a protection to the Hebrews. The king of Greece gave every encouragement to the Hebrews. So much did he adhere to their ways that he was almost persuaded to worship their Elohim. But owing to his rulers being worshipers of Hasus or the horse, they would not allow the king to turn from his former principle, namely worshiping the horse. As the priests persuaded the king, if he would turn from worshiping the horse, as they or as that was the mighty one of the Grecians in those days that his chargers would not face the battle nor enter into the war chariots. The, the Black Sea was originally called the, I think it was the boss first. No, that's a different one. But the Equian Sea or the Equian, the, uh, the ex, I'm not saying that right, but the, the Sea of Horses. It was what the Latinum or the Romans attributed to Triton and it, it was predominant because wild horses were there and gathered by the people. I believe it was equine. The equine sea, yeah. Thank you. So it says, still the king's heart was with the Hebrews, and he allowed them to go on pilgrimage to the tops of the highest mountains to worship the Elohim of Shemaim for his great deliverance of them from the cow worshippers of Egypt and the tyranny of Pharaoh. Now, I'm sorry, I didn't finish my thought. Mitzrayim was what it was originally called, but when there was sons of Yahuda who were in the land there were fighting against each other, one of them was known as Egyptus, and he was run off by his brother and went to Greece, and that place was known as Egypt because that's where he came from. And that's why that was called that way, as far as I know. But it says they would uh, they would worship Elohim on the of the Shemaim for his great deliverance of them from the cow worshippers of Egypt and the tyranny of Pharaoh, which was their custom to do once a year. This was their custom for several hundreds of years, and I put roughly from 1490 BC or right before the birth of Moshe to around 12,000 BC which was the fall of Troy. Until a war fell out between Greece and Assyria. The Hebrews then refused their young men to go to war. If you remember, they're keeping what was, well, it, it mentions in the book here that they kept what was called the laws of the altar, but they kept the instructions given to Abraham and passed down from him uh, the original writings of Hanok and the the first-hand accounts from Lemech and Noach and Abram and Yitzhak and Yaakov. These are the things that the children had that they kept, and they called them the laws of the altar, including loving their brother, not fighting people. What you see familiar with renewed covenant in instructions is the kind of things that they would keep. And you can read about these things if you look in Yobelim and uh, the book of Hanok. This is the stuff that they were familiar with, the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. They say there is a lot of Christian interpolations in it, but in reality, they had the full truth and revelation given to Jacob that he gave to his children and wrote all, it all down, as expounded in Yobelim and as seen in the Testaments. 
But it says, neither would they allow their daughters to be given in marriage to the uncircumcised Gentiles unless they would consent to be circumcised and offer seven years sacrifice in worshiping the El of Bethel. So they wouldn't give their daughters unless they stopped being pagan, which that word didn't come about until the paganism was banned as formal religion in pagan Rome. Then it was pushed to the outlaying villages or the pagani in Latin, which is where paganism or pagans come from. It, called, it was the outlaying villages of the empire where they still were involved in witchcraft or spirit worship, which they used to be the mainstream worship of the pagan uh, empires before the belief came. This is after, I already read that part, sorry. <clears throat> Yeah, no, I didn't. It says, afterwards, one of the Grecian princes fell wroth with the inhabitants of Troy, properly called the Trojans. There was born to one of the, or one of the princes of Troy, a daughter that excelled in beauty and virtue all the Grecian nation. The prince of the Grecians offered her his hand in marriage, but was refused by the laws of the altar. <clears throat> he then besieged the city of Troy with rage and drove them into the city, thinking he would make them surrender from hunger. Now, if you are familiar with the Iliad or the Odyssey, or the Greek versions of the war and fall of Troy, and then the migration of the people, it perverts the truth that you can see here. And you can see a little bit of how Satan twists things. It says, but they cried to Yahuwah, and he heard their cry and was pleased to send shoals of fish of all kinds. But the sturgeon was considered the best fish, and therefore it was chosen for sacrifice on the, on the altar. The turtle doves and pigeons were also innumerable round the city. They also made use of them for food, being also offered for sacrifice. The wild bee was also very plentiful, supplying them with honey. They lived there in comfort, while their enemies were encamped round the city, suffering many privations. One of those enemies were the Danoi, the, Gr the Greeks known as the Danoi, which is actually the, what later migrated as the Tutha de Danon, or the tribes of Dan that settled in Ireland. And this is part of the Danites that had left the land early. They were persecuting and fighting against their own brothers here with other Greeks, sadly. And you can see what happened to their, their continued disposition of acting that way, because that was what became known as the Irish Roman Catholics, who were greatly involved in the persecutions of real believers for a very long time, even to the overthrowing of America to this day. And that's why it mentions in the Testament of Dan that most, almost none of his children would be delivered because of the things that they're doing. And he mentions his anger against his brother. <clears throat> this is, but the young generation arose and new rulers refused to offer the sacrifices with the sturgeon. For as it was the best fish, they desired to keep it for themselves and offer other fish to Yahuwah. They also refused to give to the poor, the widow, the fatherless, and the orphan their proper share, neither the quality nor the quantity which they took for themselves. They began to refuse to keep the Yobelim, the Sabbath of the land, which occurred once in seven years. The custom was at or the, the custom was that if any one sold a possession, they could have it again in the year of Yobel. But that they began to refuse to do, and went contrary to the law of El. They also claimed the honey, the turtle doves, and pigeons, of which Yahuwah said that every one was to share alike, both Kohanim and people. Yahuwah was then pleased to open the eyes of Lazarus, and if you're not familiar, Lazarus is just the Greek version of Eleazar. They drop the Aleph and they add the 
the us as a masculine suffix. So El Lazar becomes Lazarus. Okay. One of the tribe of Louis or Levi, a devoted Kohen of Yahuwah, and said unto him, Take unto you a sturgeon fish and a pair of turtle doves and a pair of young pigeons and offer a shalom offering and a sin offering and a thanksgiving offering or and a thanksgiving offering saying unto the people of Yahuwah or saying unto the people Yahuwah Elohim of Shemaim has said unto me Twice seven years have I provided for your table and furnished it abundantly. And you have rebelled against me, said Yahuwah. But if you do not repent and return unto me, I will give them up to destruction. Yet instead of repenting, they became more hardened and more rebellious than ever, mocking and scoffing at the servant of Yahuwah. The Elohim of Shemaim began to withhold his loving kindnesses from them. The vines and date trees were blasted and failed in bringing forth fruit. The bees and doves and pigeons failed to supply their wants, and also the fish failed them. The harder the times were, the more they blasphemed the Elohim of Shemaim and persecuted his servants, boasting that their walls had protected them and would protect them still, and wantonly joining in all the abominations of the Gentiles, saying the Gentiles dance and make and make merry, drink wine, or sorry, they dance and make merry and drink wine, and why not we? Our walls would protect us. I apologize, the this normally comes out right, but it seems that it's out of place because of the way that the Facebook updated their algorithm with the, the Hebrew switching over. It didn't do that always. This is Yahuwah was then pleased, or Yahuwah was then about to bring on the destruction of Troy. He appeared to Lazarus, the Luiim, or the Levite, and said, Arise up early in the morning and call upon those that serve me and say unto them, Arise and depart out of this city, for truly I will destroy it, because they are a rebellious and stiff-necked people, who have hardened their hearts against me and my servants. Therefore arise at the twelfth glass at midnight, when the watches are shifted on the towers, and come to the twelfth gate, which lieth toward the sea." And a great many of them went home to their own houses when they heard the word of Yahuwah and doubted the word of the foreteller. And out of the great multitude of the inhabitants of the city, there were only about 100 souls or inner beings that did according to the word of Yahuwah. The ancient ruler Dan Daniel, or my ruler is El, my judge is El, right? And all his household and Lazarus, the Luiim, and all his household. Later on, you find by the time they get to the uh, Montrose and their homeland, or their promised land, which was what we call the Highlands of Scotland, there was only five tribes out of the 12 represented amongst the survivors. Because each time they left a different place, they left a multitude of paganized Hebrews and just the remnant that kept true to the laws of the altar would go. Here you can see only 100 left before the siege and destruction. But if you look at the ancient history of the British king or the kings of Britain, where it talks about the founding of London or Lude by Brutus, there is 88,000 Trojans that made their way from the fall of Troy over to Italy. And that's also part of the Iliad there, or the Odyssey. Sorry about that. <clears throat> but it says, the boats were all arranged at the seaside, and the scanty provisions that the city could afford were brought for their use. 
They also took on board Jacob's pillow and the marble chair, which was the seat of the prince or chief. That marble chair was sitting in Westminster Abbey still to this day, and Jacob's pillow is in, it's what every monarch of Britain's been coronated on since, for time immemorial, including the, the uh, soon-to-be future king, if he isn't already, and his mother. But it was originally taken during the, the reign of Edward the Longshanks by England, who was also another branch of wayward Hebrews ruled by a son of Yahuda. Says they also took on board Yaakov's pillow and the marble chair, which was the seat of their prince or chief. They then departed from Troy, leaving the enemies of Elohim to their fate. Immediately thereafter, Satan filled the hearts of the Gentiles with guile, so that they prepared a large wooden horse and put two men inside of it. They also took a man and cut off his nose and made him all wounds over his body. They then fled from the city, leaving all property and goods behind them. The Trojans saw next morning that the Gentiles had all fled. But seeing this wounded man standing by the side of the wooden horse, he told them that the Gentiles had all fled and that they had used him thus when he would not go along with them. And he said to them, I will tell you the whole truth of the judgments of Elohim that befell them. This man also told them that this, the wooden horse, was a mighty one sent down from the mighty ones above, for the love they bore to fair Helen of Troy. Then, instead of the Trojans giving thanks to the El of Bethel, they filled themselves with wine and strong drink and made themselves riotous, dancing around this horse. There's a lot of allusions to the, the wine of intoxication, the, the, foam, the foaming cup given to Edom, given to the daughter of Babel, given to Rome from Revelation, mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And this is the type and shadow of that. Okay. They then sought to kill the chief ruler, and therefore tell her Lazarus, but found that they had departed from the city. That very night, while they lay drunken on the streets, the Gentiles came back, and the two men that were in the wooden horse opened the gates of the city and gave them entrance, and with fire and sword they destroyed the city of Troy. But at the same time, Yahuwah was avenged of the Gentiles. There had been concealed beneath the chief synagogue some devil's fire, as the Grecians called it in those days, with which the Trojans defended their city. They took their wooden horse and put it upon the altar of the El of Bethel. But at the very moment when they crowded into the synagogue of Yahuwah, or into the synagogue, Yahuwah was pleased to consume them with fire from Shamayim, which caused the devil's fire to explode and caused the destruction of every man within the synagogue that was worshipping the horse, or Hasus. The ancient Trojans were then scattered through all the Grecian nation, and those that were left of the Greeks occupied Troy. But Yahuwah visited it with high winds, so that all the fertile lands were scorched and turned into barrenness. He also visited the city with an earthquake and sunk it with all its kings and rulers ten fathoms below the level of the sea. The spot where the city stood is now called the Bay of Pechoi. Such was the end of Troy with all its, all its splendor. Those who were left of the city under persecution were inside of the destruction of it all the time and were enabled to esteem the El of Bethel for all his goodness to them in delivering them from the same destruction. And those people, that hundred that was a remnant there, would go to Crete and then from Crete to Sicily, from Sicily to Gaul, and then from Gaul to Montrose, which is in the highlands of Scotland as they call it today. 
So just one moment. All right, so you can see from there, as far back as 1490 BC, roughly, there was Greeks, which was the sons of Yepheth with Hebrews that were intermixed, worshiping the horse. And at the fall of Troy, Hebrews worshiping the horse. Some of them were killed. Some of them were imprisoned and made slaves, and some of them were scattered. I mentioned before, 88,000 made their way to Italy. And then you can see about the founding of the Latinum people and how the rulers from Yahuda were doing things that were not building a good foundation, killing brothers, stealing succession, doing things that were not profitable that you'd see happening more and more later on. The, um, <clears throat> the, the Brutus later went and freed some of the slaves and he took them, freed Trojans with him to Britain to found the city of Lud, which were the original Britons that were contemporaries and related to Shalomo and providing the tin in that area as Hebrews during the, his reign. There was Hebrews in Spain, there was Hebrews in Italy, there was Hebrews all the way in America, all of them paying homage to Shalomo at that time. But that, this was only, what, 500 years or so, or no, 200 years or so before then was it the fall of Troy, just so you can have an idea of what was going on. This next section, which actually, this is a little skipping ahead, the next section is a, a, something that a friend shared with me here, but you can see that the the people sorry the people that were known as germans or celts are way were hebrews and i'll show more information about that in the comments here but the uh the ones that went predominantly towards the europe and the the west first learned the celtic language and the ones that went to the east first learned their language went from hebrew to germanic it shifted in different ways in the ancient history of caledonia it mentions the shift and when they started speaking what is gaelic right and there's books written in the topic by a macintosh and a stewart in the 1800s about how the the highlander gaelic from the scotland the highlanders of scotland was originally hebrew and its influence on ancient greek and latin so this is tracked both in written histories, in the language itself, and you can see it in the DNA if you look into that. The Germans, or the, the Celtic people, when they broke off, it was more of a... They kept the function of how the language worked, but they lost its use in... Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find that spot and I don't know where it's at. They lost its use in the the letters and the sounds. So they still kept the language, the function of the language. And you can see it mostly in Irish. Irish is very, very almost identical to how Hebrew was functioned still with the suffixes and prefixes, with the, the sentence structure. Everything is almost a word for word translation for that. The Welsh language which has a little bit of Assyrian influence from the Northern Kingdom being taken by Assyria and then coming over and mixing with the Britons that were there. Uh, it's almost identical, but it's a little different. And the Caledonian Scotland or the Caledonian Scottish Gaelic is the one that I was just mentioning. But when they went to the East first, what we call the Germanic branches of the Hebrews, the wayward Hebrews, they had, uh, they lost the use of the suffixes and prefixes and the, the letters locked into a certain form. And that was a, what culminated in the English language as well. But while we still have many influences in the Hebrew, you don't see it so well. This is the one I wanted to show you real quick. This is uh, information about the Druids, right? The Druids in Britain or the wayward Hebrews there worshiping Jesus. And just like you have Baal become Bel among the Celts, where the vowels changed. And if you look at that, Bel is actually a legitimate verb tense form that means Lord. 
in Hebrew. But that Jesus was the horse, Jesus, that was perverted and also worshipped as a mighty one here. It says the 18th century Druidic revivalist Lolo Margonweg identified Isus with Jesus on the strength of the similarity of their names. He also linked them both to Hu Gadarn, writing, both Hu and Huan were no doubt originally identical with the Jesus of Lati or Latinius, Lactinius, all right? And the Jesus of Lucan, described as false mighty ones of the Gauls. Again, Celtic paganized Hebrews. The similarity of the last name of Eosu, Welsh Jesus, is obvious and striking. And how it went from a H to an I is when the, you'll see it in just a moment, but when the Germans and Celts destroyed pagan Rome and adopted Catholicism, the Nicolaitan Catholic Christianity that was prevalent there, the uh, Nicolaitan Catholic Christians adopted the name Jesus for their mighty one, but they don't have an H letter in Latin and they use the I there. It says, when we simply take a step back and admit to ourselves what happened at the Council of Nicaea, the similarities between Jesus and Jesus can easily be comprehended. And it really predates, or it goes before then. I can't, or I, after that time, I can't say that that's when it happened. I don't know for certain, but I can tell you what we're going to share absolutely happened. And that was at the fall of pagan Rome, about 160 years or so, or 150 years after the time of Constantine. But it says they were one and the same. We'll get more into the meaning of the name Jesus later, which I don't know if they do, but Jesus, Jesus is a later derivative of the name Isus, pronounced Isus. This is identically or identically identical, I think it meant, to the Latin name Iosus, where we get the English word Jesus, Strong's number 2424, Iosus pr pronounced Iesus. And we'll get how they got that in just a moment. Jesus was, or two, was part of a trinity. Okay. Sorry about that. Jesus was part, or two, was part of a trinity. A well-known section of Lucan's Bellum Civili talks about the glory or the gory sacrificial offerings pro, pro offered to a triad of Celtic deities. To Tate's Jesus, an, an, apparate, or an aspirated form of Isus, and Taranis, the Ostrogoths, the Germanic peoples that mixed with the other paganized Hebrews in Spain that became known as the Spanish, still say Jesus to this day with that name. They never changed it. But it says right here, Taranis, that's the three-headed the three-headed false mighty one, right? Among a pair of later commentators on Lucan's work, one identifies two Tates with Mercury and Isus with Mars. According to the Byrne commentary on Lucan, sacrifice or men victims, remember a human is a later invention. It's part of that sort of spellcraft and tricky wordplay. But a human is defined in law as the natural man of scripture, the reprobate that's unable to receive the things of the Ruach of Elohim. So not something that we should call ourselves. But human victims were sacrificed to Isus by being tied to a tree and flailed. Now is the execution of Yahushua coming into focus. Yahushua was killed by Rome in a pagan sacrifice orchestrated by Satan. He was tied to a tree stump and flailed, and then, according to Roman legend, hung on a, a cross of Tammuz as a sacrifice. Left is a picture of Jesus, Tutus, and Tyrannus. Right is the triune false mighty one worshipped by the Vikings, and it was another version of this triple deity of Jesus, Tutates, and Tyrannus right here. So you see, and that's that trinity 
it hasn't changed. Just one moment and we'll get to the next reference. So you can see from the fall of Troy, 12, 1181 BC, to the paganized Celts and Germans, which were known to be Hebrews in antiquity and hidden from us today for the most part. So you're going from that time to the 700s BC and the founding of Rome, 500s BC, all the way to when the paganized Germans, the Scythians, known as the Germani, the genuine Scythians, as opposed to the Sarmatians, which was another branch of them that married Amazon women and became their own nation. Uh, they sacked and, and felled pagan Rome. And when they did, this history of Romanism covers what was adopted. Okay. This can be found in a book called The History of Romanism, pages 42 and 43, section 15. It says, one more circumstance is worthy of mention as contributing in no small degree to the increase of the power and influence of the bishop or little horn of Rome, viz. the regard almost universally paid to him by the fierce and barbarous tribes who now in quick succession poured in from the north, which if you remember, it said that your enemy will come from the north and destroy it. It was a foretelling against Babylon, which was the original Babylon that the Scythians were mercenaries that helped sack. And also the Scythians were a branch of the Hebrews in dispersion. If you remember, they were foretold to be the battle axe and the, and the sledgehammer through which or the, the sledging slashing thread uh, threshing sledge i'm sorry that yahoo was going to use to thresh and, sl and smash the nations this is literally the people that he used to overcome the people that would afflict them they sacked pagan rome and um they adopted that as well but getting back on this it says oh they, they were foretold to come from the north then and, and they also came from the north to sack rome because it was mystery babylon it was another fulfillment of that again nothing new under the sun that's what i meant to go with for that sorry but it says and conquered and ravaged italy and the capital of the ancient empire in the in they broke it up into 10 nation states three of which were plucked up and at the plucking up of the third or the destruction of the lombard kingdom by the king of the franks charlemagne he was crowned as the first emperor of the Holy Roman Empire or the first Reich. And the little horn was came to prominence at that time, as foretold by Daniel and expounded on later on. It says in the years 408, 409, and 410, the proud city of Rome was three times in succession subjected to a siege by the renowned Alric, king of the Goths. Al, meaning to or toward, and Reich, meaning like Richard is powerful ruler, right? Reichhard. Alric is to rule, literally what his name meant in the Hebrew that they were speaking. It says uh, he was the king of the Goths who is distinguished by contemporary historians by the terrible epitaphs of the scourge of El and the destroyer of nations. At first he was brought off or he was bought off by the terrified inhabitants, but at length the city was taken and given up to be pillaged and sacked by the fierce Gothic soldiery. In the year 452, the ferocious Attila, king of the Huns, invaded the north of Italy, laid waste some of its fairest provinces, and was only prevented from marching to Rome and renewing the horrid cruelties and excesses by of Alric, by an immense ransom and the powerful influence of the roman little horn leo the great who at the head of an embassy waited on attila as he quote or as he lay quote encamped at the place where the slow winding meniscus is lost in the foaming waves of the lake benacus and trampled with his scythian cavalry the farms of catullus and virgil you can see the Huns used the Scythians to do that thrashing again, like I was mentioning. In the year 454, Rome was again taken and pillaged by Genseric, 
or Genseric, king of the Vandals, where you get the word for vandalism. And in the year seven or 476, the Western Empire was finally subverted, and Italy, with its renowned and time-honored capital, reduced under the dominion of the Gothic barbarians by the conquest of Odasser, king of the Herili, a tribe of Goths, and the disposition and banishment of Augustulus, the last Rom Romulus Augustulus, by the way, the last of the Western Roman emperors, founded by Romulus and lost by Romulus Augustus, Augustulus, rather. <clears throat> Section 16. These barbarous nations, these fierce and warlike Germans who, after the defeat of the Romans, divided among them the Western Empire, bore with the utmost patience and moderation both the dominion and vices of the little horns and priests. How you doing? Hello. I'm okay. Because I'm about to go. Sorry. No problem, brother. Above ground. Sorry about that. We'll go ahead and continue again. But it says, They bore with the utmost patience and moderation both the dominion and vices of the little horns and priests, because upon their conversion to Christianity, and that would have been Nicolaitan Catholic Christianity, there were some believers amongst the, the, the barbarian hordes, if you will, and the ones that were believers before they came into the land there were generally known as Arians because of their belief in a rejection of the Trinity, that our Mashiach was created being and subservient and, and not equal to the Father. He is still Elder Word and Man, but uh, just for some context there, they were eventually considered heretics and wiped out, and the ones that... Uh, conformed to Catholicism, adopted the name of Catholic Christians and partook of all the abominations. As they became naturally subject to their jurisdiction, and still more because they looked upon the ministers of the, their false mighty one, Apollyon, as invested with the same rights and privileges which distinguished the priests of their fictitious deities, if you remember, they were always to give preference to Louis. The sons of Louis were the Kohanim, or the ones that were to bring light to them, and they gave veneration to their priest sex all through their history. It was a, another telltale sign of who these people are. But at this point, it was perverted because they weren't walking correctly. This is after the Northern Kingdom in dispersion rejected the truth or when apostate again after our Mashiach came. They went into the belly of the beast and have been given uh, and have given our back to one who is cruel, which is what was foretold would happen, both in the life of Yonah and in the foretellers there. It says, nor is it all, or nor is it at all to be wondered that these superstitious barbarians, accustomed as they were to regard with the feeling amounting almost to adoration, the high priests of their own heathen mighty ones, should manifest a readiness to transfer that veneration to the high priests of Rome, especially when they saw the multitude of heathen rites that were already introduced into Christian worship. And it was because of the heathen rites that they adopted that they were kicked out of the land by the Assyrians to begin with. Some of them repented, but a lot of them did not, which you can also see in antiquity. The Massagate, when they fought against Darius the Persian, suffered affliction but destroyed his army because they were more righteous than he. However, they were sun worshippers at the time. There is other forms of paganism prevalent amongst the uh, Scythians at a later time when they went perverted, but they were known in history as the most pious people, the most civilized and respectable people in the world, even though they were called barbarians. And it was only through the influence of Rome that they got perverted. This is, and the willingness of the Roman little horns, by still further increasing the number of these pagan ceremonies, to accommodate their religion 
to the prejudices and inclinations of all, which is, uh, I don't know if you know, but Pontifus Maximus means the chief bridge builder. And the Romans were assimilationists. They adopted and brought in all these paganized beliefs and things from others. Again, it stems from the founding of Rome and how that came about and into the, what they did as a religious practice where they would consort with um, what they called their ancestors in the catacombs, but they were really consorting with demons and getting their marching orders for what to do. It says, in ages of ignorance and crudelity, remarks a celebrated Scottish historian, the ministers of religion are the objects of superstitious veneration. When the barbarians who overran the Roman Empire first embraced the Nicolaitan Christian faith, they found the clergy in possession of considerable power, and they naturally transferred to those new guides the profound submission and reverence which they were accustomed to yield to the priests of that religion which they had just forsaken. They deemed their persons to be equally sacred with their function and would have considered it as impious to subject them to the profane jurisdiction of the laity, which is the common people. The clergy were not blind to these advantages which the weakness of mankind afforded them. Just so you know, the Laetine was actually a, one of the tribes of these Latinized wayward Germans that were considered the, the, the um, peasants, if you will. And that's where the word laity came from. It was, a, it was them that were the peasants that were ruled over. The clergy were not blind to these advantages which the weakness of mankind afforded them. They established courts in which every question relating to their own character, their function, their property, was tried and pleaded and obtained an almost total exemption from the authority of civil judges. And this is part of the Justinian Code, or originally the Codex Theodosian, helped to be put together by Sixtus III, the one foretold in Revelation. Says, thus was a kind of mutual compromise effected between these barbarous heathen conquerors and the Bishop of Rome and his clergy, the former generally agreeing to accept the Nicolaitan Christian name, and the latter tactically consenting to conform as much as possible to their heathen rites and ceremonies of worship. The blind submission of these heathen tribes to the degenerate ministers of Nicolaitan Catholic Christianity tended much to increase the wealth and consequently the power of the clergy. On this subject remarks the elegant historian of the Middle Ages, quote, The devotion of the conquering nations, as was still less enlightened than that of the subjects of the empire, was or so was it still more munificent or munificent meaning giving of their goods they left indeed the worship of jesus and tyrannus which they would consent to conform to as much as possible in their forest but they retained the elementary principles of that including who they were calling on which we know derives from the horse but they retain the elementary principles of that and of all barbarous idolatry, a superstitious reverence for the priesthood, a crudelity that seemed to invite imposter, and a confidence in the efficacy of gifts to expedite offenses, which would later be used by Rome for their indulgences, where you can buy your way out of purgatory, or you can buy uh, your way out of guilt of certain sins by paying the coffers that built the Vatican and other places for Rome. Just one moment here and we'll get to the next one, okay? All right, so that takes us from the wayward Hebrews of the fall of Troy all the way to the sacking of Rome and the adoption of Nicolaitan Catholic Christianity by the wayward Hebrews of, that called Germans and Celts at that time. They were given up to jurisdiction and worship of this false religion under Satan, 
because they refused to follow our creator. And as expounded by Kepha in the recognitions of Clement, there's only two kingdoms. There's only two ways you're going to be of his way or you're going to be of the enemies. And the enemy was culminating his setting up everything to be a, a mockery and place being above the stars of El to be worshipped, which is exactly what the little horn in Rome is. <clears throat> but from that time, from the fall of pagan Rome until the coming of the Wycliffe translation, you had this horse being known as Eosus, and it was only in Latin, and Hebrew was made a dead language. They killed off real believers during the Dark Ages and snuffed out the truth, literally being hidden in the fourth beast, as foretold in Second Baruch. At the time of the making of the Wycliffe translation, which happens to be the uh, it's foretold in revelation with the seven voices okay it's part of the second woe the beginning of it and it culminated in the earthquake of yarushalayim in 1834 but the uh translation that he made was from the latin vulgate here and you'll see that that's where the name was carried over again and how we get it today it says the first english translation of the scriptures was made from the latin vulgate and you also had a little bit before then, there was John Knox that made a translation. There was William Tyndale that made a translation. So there was different versions, but it was the Lollard movement and the Wycliffe translation that was became prevalent that kickstarted the Reformation about 100 years later. And he was known as the, like the, the morning star of the Reformation, kind of like Yahukanon the Immerser, John the Baptist, if you will, making the way for the truth to come. But it says, uh, the first English translation to the scriptures was made from the Latin Vulgate. Please notice the spelling for the name of our Mashiach. This would not have used the placeholders of the Greek manuscripts, showing that his name was not to be transliterated into Greek, because the Greek nor the Latin had the way to say Yahushua correctly. That's why they didn't do that. This name in particular came from the Goths, and other Germanic-speaking peoples, which we just read. This is important when considering we also get the title most everyone uses for Elohim in general, G-O-D, which is also a, a false mighty one of the Germans, which were wayward Hebrews. And you can find that condemned in Scripture in Yeshiyahu or Isaiah 65, 11, and 12, where everyone who calls on God, G-A-W-D as it's pronounced there in the Hebrew, will be consumed in fire when he returns. As, as well as those who eat swine and unclean broth and, uh, and do other things that he finds displeasing. This is, this is important when considering, we also get you know, the title. It says, when we know that the Germanic languages came from the Hebrew, we now know the prohibitions in Hebrew are directly speaking of these names and titles something to consider and then right here is evidence for that this is actually a screenshot from the 1886 webster's dictionary on the english language it goes through and shows the entirety of the standardized english language at that time as well as giving you a history of the english language from the Germanic and all the shifts that happened with the coming of the Danes and the Normans and the other things that happened to change the language into the modern English of America at that time. So this section was about the history of English, and this is actually an excerpt from the Wycliffe translation of the Bible, where you can see that our Mashiach's name, Yahushua's name, was actually J because the Iosus from the Latin he kept the I as a J, but that still would have been a Yod sound until the English changed their, their tense, right? And then H-E-S-U-S, -S, or Eosus, Jesus right there. And that is where you get, you see it again, this is where you get that name in the common vernacular. In the book of Gad the Seer, chapter 1, when he's talking about the three woes that will happen to the lamb, the second woe, which was part of the 
making it started with in, with 1390 in the making of this translation that woe is where his refuge would be lost and the refuge of our mashiach the refuge of his people is his name you can do a word study just put in my refuge or just put in refuge and look what it says and you'll find that it is the name of yahuwah that is the refuge for for those that trust in him it was lost at this time and this is the absolute evidence of that okay because when he translated it from the latin vulgate he used lord instead of yahuwah and jesus instead of yahushua another evidence for that is right here you can see it's actually a word sense that was there all right <clears throat> And I'd put, so I now have direct evidence for an idea that came to mind years ago, but I could not prove it. But I want to find the best way to present it. Still thinking on that, and ob willing, this will be not the best way, but this is one way that people can see this. It says, did you know all so-called Germanic and Celtic languages came from what the world calls Hebrew? And in this post, I have evidence proving that too, so it's not just making things up. But give me one moment and we'll get to the next section. Okay, so we've covered pretty much the entire written history that I have gathered together from the tracking of Jesus to Jesus to Iosus to Jesus to Jesus. Because eventually, in the English language, they dropped that H. And it was just J-A-E-S-U-S. Which <clears throat> identical to the Welsh Isus, like they mentioned, and literally from the horse in Hebrew. Uh, now, if you want to look at the etymology of Eosus, and you can take that word and type it in, break it up, do E, the first part of it literally means he sent in Latin. And then you look up Seuss in Latin and it's pig. So it's literally the sent pig is the horse one or the other and how that translates antiochus epiphans as a foreshadow of the little horn later on in a spiritual sense literally set up a statue of zeus in the altar in the temple of our creator and sacrificed a pig on the altar sixtus the third right calling on jesus had the mass on december 25th same time that that happened with Antiochus, as the abomination of desolation that desolates the inner being or the, the dwelling place of our Elohim, which is in man. So there's the culmination of that, but that's where it comes from. And you can even see it in the languages and the words that are used, literally. But not to get on to, to Latin or to Greek or anything like that. We want to stick with just what it says in the Hebrew here. This is some references from scripture about the horse. Okay. This is the horse in Hebrew is Hasus or Jesus. When they migrated, it became Jesus, right? And then it says, there is no chokmah, wisdom, or comprehension, or counsel against Yahuwah. Hasus is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is of Yahuwah. Mishli or Proverbs 21, 30, and 31. The wings of the ostrich flap joyously but they are not the pinions and plumage of a stork, which the word for stork is loving kindness, chesed, right? It's the same word. She leaves her eggs on the ground and warms them in the dust, and she forgets that a foot might crush them or a wild beast tread on them. She treats her young harshly as if not hers. Her toil is in vain without fear. Because Eloah has made her forget Chokmah and did not endow her with comprehension. When she lifts herself on high, she laughs at Jesus, or the horse, and its rider. That theme is what we'll see in a little bit. <clears throat> but the ostrich, the one that buries its head in the sand and ignores what's going on around it, thinking that will make him safe, is not something that we should do right? Have you given Hasus strength? Have you covered his neck with a mane? Would you make him leap like a locust, like the Byzantine army, right? 
His splendid snorting is frightening. He paws in the valley and rejoices in strength. He gallops into the clash of arms. He laughs at fear and is not frightened, nor does he turn back from the sword. And if you know the fear of Elohim, the sword is the word. He, he snorts at these things and ignores it. People that venerate them act the same way. The quiver rattles against him, the glittering spear and lance. He eats up the ground with fierceness and rage, and he does not stand still because of the voice of the shofar. At the blast of the shofar, he says, aha, and from afar, he smells the battle, the thunder of commanders and shouting. Job 39, 13 through 25. Hallelujah, for it is good to sing praises to our Elohim, for it is pleasant, praise is fitting. Yahuwah builds up Yarushalayim, he gathers the outcasts of Yisrael. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He appoints the number of the stars. He gives names to all of them. And again, what are the stars? Who are the outcasts? All these things are parables. They all have meaning. And it foretells what has actually happened. Great is our master and mighty in power. There is no limit to his comprehension. Yahuwah lifts up the meek ones. He throws the wrong ones down to the ground. Respond to Yahuwah with thanksgiving. Sing praises on a lyre to our Elohim, who covers the Shemaim with clouds, who prepares rain for the earth, who makes grass to sprout on the mountains, giving to the beast its food, to the young ravens that cry. He does not delight in the strength of Hasus. He takes no pleasure in the legs of a man. Yahuwah takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who wait for his loving kindness. Extol Yahuwah, Yarushalayim, praise your Elohim, Zion, for he has strengthened the bars of your gates, he has Baruch, your children, in your midst. Who makes shalom in your borders, he satisfies you with the finest wheat. Who sends out his command to the earth, his word runs very speedily. Who gives snow like wool, he scatters the frost like ashes, throwing out his hail like pieces, who, who does stand before his cold. He sends out his word and melts them. He causes his wind to blow, the waters flow, declaring his word to Yaakov, his laws and his right rulings to Yisrael. He has not done so with any nation, and they have not known his right rulings. Hallelujah. Which again, the common law is, is a unique law system that is only amongst his children. And they don't know the origin of it. It's from antiquity, traced all the way back to 510 BC. And the Britons of, uh, of the original times, they're only 200 years after the Northern Kingdom in dispersion. And they were keeping the laws that are in the, the Torah. It was fully made known when it was codified by, oh, oh I, I can't remember his name. He, he actually codified the, the common law, which started with the Ten Commandments and then the right rulings right out of Exodus 21 through 23. And then other rulings that they had had and that is the common law that is the american law that our our country is founded on i can't remember his name at the moment either i'm sorry i'll get that for you later but this was from tehillim or psalms 147 verse 1 through 20 it says let me instruct you and teach you in the way you should go let me counsel my eye be on you do not be like hasus like the mule with no comprehension and if you remember a mule is a donkey and a horse that's mated that's sterile the donkey is the first covenant believers as in typified in ishmael and expounded by shaul where hagar was the first covenant in sinai right her children are those first covenant adherents which were the covenant believers of the added bonds because of transgression 
they were ones that were foreshown in Yishmael in his life and what he did. Okay. But it says, don't be like Hasus or like the mule with no comprehension, with bit and bridle, else they do not come near you. Many are the sorrows of the wrong, but as for the one trusting in Yahuwah, loving kindness surrounds him. Be glad in Yahuwah and exalt you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Tehillim, Psalms 32, 8-11 the stout-hearted have been stripped. They slept their sleep, and none of the mighty men have found their hands. At your rebuke, Elohim of Jacob, both the rider and the horse, Hasus, lay stunned. You, you are to be feared, and who would stand in your presence when you are displeased? Tehillim or Psalm 76, 5 through 7. Now the rider of Jesus, Apollyon there is, is Satan. Okay. The sovereign is not delivered by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. The horse is a vain means of deliverance. Neither does it rescue any by its great power. See, the eye of Yahuwah is on those fearing him, on those waiting for his loving kindness to deliver their inner being from death and to keep them alive during scarcity of food. Our inner being has longed for Yahuwah, our help and our shield is he. For our heart does rejoice in him, for we have put our trust in his Kodesh name. Let your loving kindness, Yahuwah, be upon us, even as we wait for you. Tehillim or Psalm 33, 16 through 22. I have come in my father's name and you do not receive me which is true from that time. The truth is what unchanging. And when he came as Yahuwah, they were still rejected. The 12 sons had turned apostate, some of them, and their children reflect that in antiquity and on to this day. If another comes in his own name, him you would receive. And how are you able to believe when you are receiving esteem from one another? And the esteem that is from the only Elohim you do not seek, which is doing his will. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moshe, in whom you have set your expectation. Which Moshe says, anyone slaughtering to a, an Elohim other than Yahuwah is put under the ban. Very clear, unequivocal. For if you believed Moshe, you would have believed me since he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how shall you believe my words? Yahuchanan, or John 5, 43 through 47. And there's just one more reference I'd like to share before we, we break off here. So just one moment. All right, and then we have a separate Shabbat study going over this particular chapter of Gad the Seer, and I think the whole book actually, in different studies on the YouTube series already. So I'm not going to, excuse me, <clears throat> I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I wanted to point out this is from Gad the Seer chapter one. It was a vision given to him that for the Ben of Yeshai, or the son of Jesse, as they call it, now this is the former, the, the son, and then he is a gift. He is a present. Is how you can see what Yeshai breaks down to. Who our Mashiach is a true gift to people. He is our, our life. He's the word from the bosom of the Father through which all things were made and through which we have redemption to him. Now, I just want to get to this part, which is the song of the Lamb which is also mentioned in Revelation in relation to the song of Moshe as well. And if you read, I believe it's in Exodus chapter 15, the song of Moshe is also about the horse and the rider. <clears throat> but right here, it says, And I heard the sound of the song of the Lamb saying, 
I shall give thanks unto you, Yahuwah. For though you were angry with me, you relented. For Yahuwah is my strength and song, and he is become my redeemer. I will sing unto Yahuwah, for he is highly exalted. Hasus and his rider has he thrown into the reed sea. Rise up intelligence, rise up power, rise up sovereignty, rise up majesty and esteem, rise up to help Yahuwah. For Elohim has delivered one who has strayed and had and obliterated the impurity from the earth. He fought my fight and brought into the light my righteousness by his help. My help comes from Yahuwah who made the Shamayim and earth. Amen, who is like unto you, esteemed in set apartness, but not in impurity. For you are great over all, raised over all, you spoke and acted. For you declared the end from the beginning, and you sealed everything with your word and turned my heart and tormented me. For your seal is on me, my master, and these three branches of the vine and twelve palms that are on my heart. Or, and these are three branches of vine and the twelve palms on my heart, meaning the three patriarchs, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and the twelve sons or the twelve tribes. <clears throat> also the three ages and the twelve tribes collectively, but the three patriarchs and the twelve sons of Yaakov, literally. And these are on the heart. This is our Mashiach, the Song of the Lamb, if you recall. But I want to point out right here, he mentions, you're esteemed in Kodeshah, but not in impurity. If you look up, if you look into the third commandment, it literally says, you do not lift up, bear, or carry the name of Eth, Yahuwah, your Elohim, to Shwa, which is a lie, falsehood, fabrication, not, or ruin. For he will not purify or cleanse the one who lifts up eth his shem to a lie, falsehood, fabrication, not, or ruin. Which is exactly what we do when we don't call on Yahuwah, Yahushua, but we call on the Lord Jesus, if you will. Because that's literally Baal, the horse. And that's part of the Baalim, or the lords, that are going to be removed from the mouths of his children also mentioned in the foretellers these things are literally written people just don't actually think about it it says your seal is on me my master and these are the three branches of vine and the 12 palms that are on my heart you gave me grandeur you erase the vanity of fearing man you gave me or sorry and you gave me a pure heart forever this is our mashiach speaking for that I will praise you at all times and thank you among the nations. For you have redeemed me greatly for my king and did favor to Dawid HaMashiach or beloved the Mashiach and his seed forever and ever. <clears throat> and I heard a voice crying from Shemaim saying, You are my son, not you are my co-equal that I've split off from myself, right? That's a perversion. The Trinity is a satanic doctrine. If you hadn't realized that with what we just read above, if you watch the Antichrist for Dummies video series, you will see unequivocal evidence that the Trinity is not something that we should do. It was also part of the Edict of Thessalonica, or Thessalon Thessalonica, sorry, where it was mandated for Catholic Christians to believe in the co-equal Trinity or they would suffer persecution by the sword of Rome. But he says, you are my son. You are my firstborn. You are my first fruit. Have I not brought you from over Shihol, or Sihol to be my daily delight, which is a reminiscent of Proverbs 8. But you have thrown my presence away and dressed up the impure with the pure. Meaning... Woe unto me, my refuge, my name was lost, right? But he still accepted those that were blind in the way. Yirmiyahu 31, we were just reading about that. There's other references to it. And it says, and that is why all these things happened to you. 
why Yeshayahu or Isaiah 53 happened was because he forgave the children their inequities and mixed the pure with the impure. When he had said to Moshe, leave me alone and let me wipe them out as a nation, he says, forgive your people or, or blot my name out of the book too, right? And who is like unto you among all creatures on earth? For in your shadow lived all these, and by your wounds they were healed. This is the Father speaking to the Son, okay? For that, consider well that which is before you. And because you have fulfilled the words of the shepherd, all the days you have been in the Son, he came like the bridegroom. The bridegroom is the Son from, he was the light of the world, right? Psalm 19. And you did not leave them, therefore all this honor shall occur to you, meaning brought to the right hand of the Father, okay? And I, we, we don't need to read that part. Again, we covered this before. So you can see here the Song of the Lamb talking about that very refutation of calling on Jesus and identifying who our Mashiach is which I mentioned right here, okay? Jesus and his rider are swallowed up, come out of her, my people. Jesus is the name of a German pagan false mighty one, as is G-O-D, and these are not even to be in our mouth, right? So just one moment, and I'll show you the references that you can see for how the languages and the people are actually Hebrew, so we have the ancient history of Caldonia, which you already read, or I already shared with you a portion of it above. A second witness to that is this article right here, whereas there are more than one exodus out of Egypt, and talks about Cadmus, Calcol, Darda, and these things from another and other sources. Okay. You also have a second witness to English or Germanic and Celtic or Gaelic languages being from the Hebrew right here. In this blog, it says, were the ancient British tongues related to Hebrew? And it covers German and Gaelic. Or it covers the English, which is a low German dialect, and Gaelic. Another witness to that, you can find... Uh, hold on. I should also have a few more that I don't see right here, but I'll just tell you about them. There's another evidence of Germanic languages coming directly from Hebrew in a doctrinal dissertation by a gentleman named Terry Bloodgit in 1981. It was what he got his doctorate from, and it's called The Phonological Similarities of the Germanic and Hebrew Languages. I've read that before to some people. I've shared it quite a bit. I have some things on Facebook with it, but it's freely available online if you just look it up. And then there's also, again, that, that the list of the ancient kings of Britain from Brutus to Codwaller. In there, you have the account of the paganized Trojans founding Rome and from there going to Britain. And you can see them carrying across the Hebrew peoples there. So, Ob willing, Everyone can see that this isn't a subject that's very pleasant. Of course, no one likes to be lied to or find out they've been lied to. But it is absolutely important, vital for loving and clinging to the truth in love, if that's what your desire is to do. So, Ab willing, we all will. Thank you for your time, and you have a wonderful Shabbat.